Hi everybody, welcome back to our little green pasture. I want to talk to you today about spiritual exhaustion. Maybe that may ring a bell to you. I think it rings a bell to us throughout our whole life when we become born again and start off on our spiritual journey towards home in heaven. Maybe that describes you right now. And you know, I speak this to every age. And because there's spiritual exhaustion from the beginning all the way to the end, that's been my experience. But I want to narrow some things down with you today and to you. This morning, I got up, I was with the Lord, and it was one of those wonderful times of the teaching of the Holy Spirit. You know his voice. You can tell when he's talking to you. There's something so penetrating. A source, the source from another world. Him living in you. The beautiful Holy Spirit. We love him, don't we? So before I get started, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask him to touch your heart today as he touched mine this morning. Father in heaven, it is you that I bow before to. Lord, it is you that I bow to. For I seek you, Lord God, in this message, that, Lord, you would touch every heart, every soul every person, no matter what age they are, that, Lord, you would open up their ears to hear your voice by your spirit, that, Lord, you would open up their eyes, that you would cause them to see you and to open up their understanding to understand you, because to understand you is to know you. Lord, make yourself known to them in this message as you sweetly gave it to me and strengthened me with strength in my soul. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would be the center point of all of this. And I will follow you. And I pray let everybody gain wisdom, peace, nourishment, power, and strength as they go on another day in their walk, in their race, in their journey towards the upward mark of their prize, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You know, a lot of us are familiar with spiritual exhaustion, and I think some people are not really familiar with it. I think that we lose sight of the fact that we're tripartite beings, meaning tri meaning three, three parts, spirit, soul, and body. And I think that in my experience and just living, it's so easy to look at church structure and say, well, I'm not in leadership, therefore I'm not a leader. Um, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a worship leader. I'm not a Bible study teacher. I don't head up any groups. I don't have a ministry. And so we tend to overlook that we are all servants of the King, our Lord Jesus Christ. And that there is spiritual exhaustion in the place where he has put you, where he has put us. You know, it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, remain in the same place where he's called you and it goes on you can read that it gives a list of different places of where people are even if they're people in captivity in prison they say well then you become the lord's free man you know i just want to focus in on this because i didn't always obviously have this youtube channel i i had a and i still do have an incredibly regular humble life and i'm happy about that but I can certainly say, looking back, yeah, I have experienced absolute spiritual exhaustion 
on many different levels. Spiritual exhaustion and, you know, because, well, spiritual exhaustion in, you know, focusing on the Lord for myself in impossible situations and serving a husband and serving children, serving in a household, serving pets, serving neighbors, um, even giving cups of cold water to my enemies. There's always service that you are doing. So don't underestimate, don't undercut yourself. Like I know, but I don't have a ministry. Your life is the ministry of Christ. He purchased you to reveal his son in. He told that very thing. Paul said that in first in Galatians 1:16. It said, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. That means you too. Even though maybe you weren't born in a Christian home, but later on you came to Christ because you heeded his call. So let me go further. Let me just keep going. I'm going to start with Isaiah 40 and I'm going to read 28 through 31. M many of you are familiar with this verse, but I want to take it apart and I want to let those beautiful living waters from heaven flow through me as a vessel into you and that he would open up a fountain in you of peace. It says, hast thou not known and hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I remember when I started to read that word in my youth, I just cleaved onto that because I just saw all those places where he he gives power when you're faint and all these things, you know, and I would just hang on them. But at this side of life, I'm seeing it as really the whole round Christian life from the time you're born again. It can mean you were born again at 16. It can mean you were born again when you were 50. I don't know. But, you know, we are babes when we come in to the kingdom as a new creation. Because you truly are born again when you are born again then you've been born again in the spirit and you start off as a babe. And so many people get caught up in wanting the end of the matter. They want to run and not be weary. They want to walk and not faint. And so what happens when they do that, they are really trusting in their own self. They don't know better. I didn't know better, but I always found myself in a way of being faint, you know, aside from other things that are pressing in the, in the earthly life. But the spiritual life has to do first with the earthly life. And we learn that along our path. We may read the words and repeat those words to ourselves to try to get our mind adjusted to that. And that's part of it. But like Jesus says, those words have to sink down deep into your ears and into your heart. And that is where Christ dwells. And that is where you learn to serve him is from your heart. So we read where he says, have you not known? Have you not heard? You know, he makes sure to let you know that he's the everlasting God. He sets the foundation of himself being in control of your whole life. Even when it doesn't feel like it. And so I want to move on to another category of those that are, you know, working and serving the Lord where, you know, because it is a category. I mean, those of us who are teachers and those of us who are, you know, always in the realm of praying, I'm not saying that you're not 
other people are who are not having a YouTube channel or not doing this. Look, I just do this because the Lord has put it in my heart to fulfill his will. I take no credit for it whatsoever. But I'm trying to be careful to say that your life is very precious to him, but there's different categories of service. And so I want to speak to those of you who are, you know, maybe you're teaching your children, you're maybe teaching a group, you're whatever it is, you have some kind of a ministry going on, which is your life, because you are a fountain of life. Those living waters should be flowing through you. And so you feel that there are times where you are just spent. I know I get there where I am just spent. And, you know, it dawned on me where I thought, you know, sometimes I feel such a powerful spiritual faintness. And then I realize I, of course, I mean, I have my daily devotions. But something became even more real to me over the last couple of days about spiritual exhaustion. Because when you are really praying and you're really going to the Lord and you're really doing your best to teach other people about Jesus Christ, it's not just in word, but you're acting it out in deed. Your body is the vehicle by which your the Holy Spirit who mingles with your spirit within uh, and your soul takes part of that and touches the spirit, then your soul who is yourself within this tent, the body, uh, the Holy Spirit has his way in the outward place of life and where you are at. So whether you are a minister, whether you are teaching a Bible study, um, maybe you're at work and you're saying, I can't even talk about the Lord, but you're bringing Christ with you and you're demonstrating who he is or you're raising children, or you've got out of control teenagers, or you have a spouse that wants nothing to do with the Lord, or he's lukewarm, or she is lukewarm, but you are that one person, and you're always standing in the gap somehow, because there's different categories of service, and service to the Lord just isn't what the visible is, what you think it is. It's not like, you. oh, well, look at Joni. Yeah, anybody can sit and make a YouTube channel. I turn everything over to the Lord. This is his, this is his green pasture. This is his idea. And I do the best that I can to let his light shine. But in my spiritual exhaustion, the Lord really did speak to me and he spoke to me in these words. But I'm I'm going to return back to this. So I'm going to pull some more things out of it, but I don't want to do that until I've gone further. So I'm going to carry on. So when I think about exhaustion, there's a physical exhaustion, but our bodies can always go to sleep and then we can wake up. But don't you feel, those of you who are born and been made alive in the spirit, that if your spirit is exhausted, your soul is going to feel it and your body is going to feel it. So really, the spiritual exhaustion is far greater than your physical exhaustion. I think of those words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2.23. I pray, for I pray, that the God of peace sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, and body. Next time I talk to you guys, I'm going to talk about sanctification and what it really means to be sanctified to him. And I don't want to weave that in here because I want to stick to one thing about spiritual exhaustion. And the next time I see you, I'm going to speak, be speaking directly to you about what it really means to be sanctified by God and by you sanctifying yourself to him because it takes two to tango. Um, so let me go on. You know, in your spiritual exhaustion, Spiritual exhaustion means that your vital forces are worn out. They're just worn out. You got nothing to give. Have you ever been called upon where somebody needs prayer or they want to ask you something about the Lord or maybe some something, somebody, and you're like, I, you, physically, you're like, okay, I'm going to get up and do it, but you're empty. You know, spiritual exhaustion never comes through sin. You notice that? David says, 
in Psalm 38, he talks about his whole physical body going down be, and weak and spent and he felt destroyed and he had no strength and he was on the bed of language. He spoke about all those things because he said there is sin. He had sin that brought him down. So it was his outward man that felt the weight and power of sin, his own sin upon him. That's been my experience when I've sinned. Um, yes, my spirit man is, you know, like, wow, I can't believe you did that. But shame cloaks my whole spirit, soul and body. And my physical body goes down. But my spiritual ex exhaustion, I found out never has come from sin, but from always moving, working, doing. And I don't buy into that lie and don't buy into it either. People telling you, well, that's works. That's works. I'll tell you something. If you don't, the natural born again believer, you can't help but do those things that God wants you to do. That's how you express your love to him. So don't let anybody rip you off and tell you, well, that's works. That's works. They're tied up in error. You know, I can, I, I'm, I'm going to do a whole show, show, a whole teaching on works just to like throw that off a cliff and shatter it into dust particles and call the Lord the send an east wind to blow it away. I am going to do it. Anyways, let me get back to it. You know, so spiritual exhaustion I have found never comes through sin, but through a lot of service when you're serving the Lord. So whether or not you're exhausted, uh, it, it will depend on where you get your spiritual supplies. Look, Jesus was exhausted. Everybody who's had a physical body that serves the Lord is going to feel exhausted. You know, remember when Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep? But notice he never gave he never gave him nor any of the other disciples. He gave them nothing to feed them with. So what was Jesus expecting Peter to do? We're not looking at literal sheep, but he sees people. But Peter, Jesus gave Peter and the rest of them three and a half years of an example exactly how to do it. And, you know, have you ever been filled with so much of that power of the Holy Spirit? Many of you have. You'll know what I'm talking about. Where you've come under the power of the Holy Spirit. He's welled up in you. You receive. It's almost too much where you're like, there's been a couple times in my life where I've said, Lord, it's too much. You would think that you wouldn't say it. But it is a power our bodies are not able to actually take. You would think that you wouldn't say, Lord, it's too much. But unless you have, have uh, gone through that, you will understand what I'm saying. So, but when we're giving and giving and giving, that's because we're going and going and going to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're opening up ourselves to him. We're receiving uh, nourishment for our own strength, for our own self, but not just for ourself. Because if you... You really are, your heart is alive in Christ, then it is by osmosis. You're not living for yourself anymore. No way. You want nothing to do with it. And as you grow and go along, the more you can't stand uh, anything for yourself, there is a process of sanctifying. There is a process. You may not even be knowing that you're, process, you're being processed by the Holy Spirit into leaving yesterday behind. And all of its sin and all of its failings and all the things, which, by the way, are for your instruction. So don't feel so bad and don't let Satan tell you, look at everything you did wrong. I love countermanding him and saying, yeah, and that's how I learned not to listen to you and go your way, liar. Okay, so let me go further. So as I was talking about a process, there's also a process of being made broken bread and being poured out wine you know i think of the what's the uh jesus told a parable a certain lawyer asked him uh uh master um who is my friend because jesus asked him what is the greatest uh commandment he said to love the lord with all thy heart with all thy mind with all thy strength and with all thine understanding 
and to love thy neighbor as thyself. And, 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 you know, so he said, was like, well, who, and Jesus said, well, well, the interaction was about who is your neighbor, who is your neighbor. And so the, of course there's that, that, uh, parable. I believe it was more than a parable. I think it was real because it said there was a certain, uh, a certain priest. Uh, no, there was a certain man who was uh, going down from Jerusalem on his way to Jericho and thieves fell upon him and they beat him and they stripped him and they wounded him and they left him half dead. And a certain priest came upon him and saw him and passed by him. And then a certain lawyer or I forgot what priest, lawyer, some, not a lawyer, a certain priest, another priest saw him and passed by him. And then there was a Samaritan who saw him and he poured in his oil and his wine, put him on his beast, took him to an inn and told the innkeeper, um, take care of him and what more that you pay for him. When I return, I will repay you. But you see that Samaritan had oil and wine. You know. False religious people and fake bodies of Christ. They like to boast about these things that they have. And all in their flocks are people that are wounded. They they have fallen into the hand of the thief, Satan. They have fallen. They have been wounded. They have been stripped by him, beaten by him. And they're half alive and they're sitting in churches every day. And there's all this talk of, you know, I, I know I'm breaking off here for a second, but have you ever looked up churches? And they're really all the same. You go online and there's these really, really great looking websites and it shows multiple pictures of happy families and everybody looks upper crust, upper scale, and um, everything is like sharp. And the wording is, we are a family of believers and we stake everything on Christ and we love everyone that comes to us and and all we care about is souls. I have visited many of those churches and they were it was like visiting uh Alaska, walking into frigid environments or going somewhere where you think there's going to be food and there's nothing. Um and it's just hype and it's show and there's not even any evidence of the Holy Spirit in those places. So when Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep, and he had gave him nothing to feed them with, Peter understood what that meant. You know why? Because he lived with Christ for three and a half years. And it takes living with Christ. You have to live with Christ. If you are really born again, then he is living in you and he is with you even right now. But you see, just like I was talking about sanctification, Jesus even says to the Father, Father, for their sakes, I have sanctified myself. And then we are told by Paul, he says, I pray that the God of peace sanctify you, Holy Spirit, soul, and body. And then there's another place that talks about us sanctifying ourselves unto God. So, there's always this moving towards God and moving away from this earth, moving away from its affections, from its attractions, from its lusts. So there is a process of being made broken bread and poured out wine. I'd rather be the Samaritan than them. I'd rather be him. You know why? because he was a man full of mercy. He had nothing to boast about. He had no letters before and after his name. He was leader over nothing. He was just a man. And I want to be a, just a woman. I want to be God's woman. And so do you. And you want to be God's man. You want to be just like that man. You don't want to act like a religious person. And like Jackie Pullinger says, and she was a missionary to China for over 30 years. And she says, if you're not willing, she goes, there are no specialists in God's kingdom. She said, if you are not willing to do everything, don't you dare say you have a ministry. So, yeah, be careful where you get your supply 
or before long, you're going to be utterly exhausted. You know, it really depends where you are getting your supply. Because you see, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, you can. You can go do stuff. Go ahead. Find out where it gets you. I've done it. Where I've gone out thinking, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do this and that in the name of Jesus. And just because I'm quoting his name, the Lord doesn't obey me. The Lord doesn't follow me. The Lord doesn't come into my agreement. And he let me fall and fall and faint and stumble so that I will learn to walk in the way of good men on that highway of holiness, which is called a way. And the word the redeemed of the Lord shall walk in. And so Jesus didn't need to give Peter anything. He fed them with Christ, with spiritual food. And it's not just a black and white, thus saith the Lord, turn to this page. I have been to many churches where it's like, ah, they tell you, turn to this page. And then they turn, you turn to a page and you just feel starving still. I don't want to starve anymore. I want to feed on Christ. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And he wants us to be full of the Holy Spirit. You know, remember when Jesus was sitting at the well? He was exhausted. His disciples wanted to go buy food for him to eat. And John chapter 4, read the whole story because I don't want to get into it. But after he revealed himself, even in his exhaustion, he was on target. You know why I believe God was, Jesus was on target? Yes, I know he was fully God. Yes, I know he was fully man. But he was tired. It said, being exhausted with it in his journey, he sat upon a well. The well of life sat upon a well who told a woman that if she would drink of the waters, of the living waters, that a well, she'd never thirst again, and that a well would be opened up within her. Well, what is a well for? To be there stagnant? No way. A water is dug in down deep, <clears throat> excuse me, into the earth. And that it is drawn from to feed the thirsty. And it's cool. And it's fresh. And it is artesian. It is artesian waters. I love what Spurgeon says. You cannot preach conviction of sin unless you have suffered it. You cannot preach repentance unless you have practiced it. You cannot preach faith unless you have exercised it. True preaching is artesian. It wells up from the great depths of the soul. If Christ has not made a well within us, there will be no outflow from us. And you know what you are? You're made of the dirt of the earth. And it says in the word in Psalms, it says, for the heart of man is deep. And in Psalm 130, verse 1, out of the depths, O Lord, have I cried unto thee, O Lord, hear my voice. See, there's the deep places that only you can serve Christ from. And it is spiritual. Once you have been made alive, there's no turning back. You want Christ even from the day you've been born again. So let me go back about the process of being made broken bread and pouring out wine and being careful where we get our supply from. I, I just want to touch on that one more thing. So, you know, so be careful where you get your supply from. Don't just go and get it third party. Be careful you're not just get, getting a third party. Not understand it is important to educate yourself with people that have, have had inspired learning. Of course, we want to read what it was said. You know why? It's not their words. It was revealed to them by that source, their source, their supply. And that's why those living waters, we're still drinking from them. All those people that have gone before were fountains that were opened. They weren't fountains shut up and springs sealed. You know, before other souls 
you're praying for and talking to and teaching to and trying to explain to them about the Lord and having patience with them, you're drawing on the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who you're drawing from. That's the waters that you're drawing from directly. And I think about a scripture. I'm going to go back to that. And it's Isaiah 60, verse 16, 60, verse 16. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles. This is the millennial reign. This is spoken to the Jewish nation. And there will also also be Gentiles there too, okay? But it says, thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shall suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy savior and thy redeemer the mighty one of jacob you know when i saw that i thought you know before souls that were praying for to learn how to draw on the life of the lord jesus christ directly on their own they're going to have to draw on it through you first and through me and and we're going to have to literally be sucked until they learn to take their nourishment from God. And I remember this and I'll say it really quickly when I had babies and I was, my body was feeding them. I mean, you burn 1200 calories a day. And so you're hungry. And so life is coming out of you. You know, we're, we're, we are to desire the sincere milk of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we like as infants, when we come in, we're sucking that sincere milk of the word that has all the everything in it to make babies grow okay but i think we're supposed to feel that they that we have to be literally sucked until they learn to take their nourishment from god and if you're really truly truly teaching people and spending and willing to spend and be spent and you go on with christ and you keep pushing forward and you keep teaching no matter if they ex you know, it's exhausting. I'm here to, I believe the Lord wants you to know that he sees you. He doesn't want you to forget where the well is, that he is the only source of your power, the only source of power and strength to do everything he wants you to do in the lot that he has called you in as a believer. And I believe in my personal experience also that we owe it to God also to be our best for his lambs and his sheep and as well for himself i just want so much to be my best for christ you know it really becomes so highlighted when you're older you're like lord i just want to go all the way with you i want to live for you but and you and when and you get there you realize when you're saying i all the time it has nothing to you're only wanting to give yourself away for others so it is my personal experience that we do owe it to God because he was our he was best for us right and so we want to be our best for Christ so i want to ask you has the way that you have been serving God has it brought you to sheer exhaustion i want to ask you that question because i think sometimes you know there's a saying that um some say that you come to a point where you sit down in the middle of the road and you realize you can't go any further that you just you're weak you're tired you need direction you need wisdom you just have to sit down i want you to think about the way you've been serving god so i think that in doing that if you Think about those days that you first began serving him. Then you're going to recall your first love, your former affections, and who you placed them on and the foundation you began to build on. Look at Galatians 3.3. 3. Paul says, are you so foolish? Having begun the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You know, that is a sharp word and they deserved it. Because there's a lot of people that knowingly say, we'll take it from here. I mean, isn't that like the Laodicea period where 
they didn't even know that they were blind, poor, naked, miserable, wretched. They didn't even know it because they were blind. That means they're unsaved. That means were they ever saved? Because anybody can say anything about the Lord. You know, Jesus says, I know your works that you say, uh, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot, but you are lukewarm. Therefore, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And he said, because, and he, this is the indictment, because you say you are rich and have need of nothing and knoweth not that you're wretched and poor and blind and naked and miserable. I don't know any born again people that come under those words. Only unsaved people are like that. Or people who say, no, I'm a Christian, but there's no power in their life. There's no power of an endless life. There's no glory to glory. There's no faith to faith. There's no right falling seven times and rising again. They have, they build an outward kingdom around themselves. They build an outward visual kingdom and inward. They are spiritually blind, spiritually naked, spiritually wretched, spiritually miserable, and spiritually impoverished. That's no born again people I know. I want you to hear what it says and what Jesus says to the first church. There's seven churches mentioned in Revelation. They were literal churches during his day, during the day he was in heaven at this point. This is a letter to the churches. Um, they were little, literal churches during that time in the first century, but they also correspond and speak to the seven church periods through the last 2,000 plus years that Christ has been in heaven, okay? So he says it to the first one, unto the angel, which means pastor, messenger, because the angel has different connotations. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Remember I spoke about Peter lived with Christ. He lived with him for three and a half years. He wasn't born again yet, but he lived with him. People live around you. They work around you. They see Christ in you. They may not say it. They may revile you. They may ignore you. They may yell at you. They may be aloof. Maybe they may say, oh, yeah, that's interesting. I appreciate it. Um, but there's a light that is in you that no darkness can be around. So that's why they're mad at you. Okay. That's why they don't want to be around you. Count it all joy when all men speak evil of you, for your reward is great in heaven. But he says, so it says, he walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which correspond to the seven churches. And the candlestick is the light, right? You are the, he says, who, who, Jesus says, which of you lights a candle and puts it on a candlestick and puts it under a table? Doesn't, isn't he supposed to put it in the middle of the house? So everybody that comes in, comes into the light. If you truly are in Christ and Christ is in you, then he's in the midst of you, in within you. And you live in Christ in the midst of his life. You're sharing real life with Christ the same way Peter did, Paul, James, John, all of, well, Paul didn't, but all the other, the 12 disciples did, even that Judas. They all lived around him. So he goes on to say, I know your works and thy labor and your patience and how you can't bear them that are evil. And has tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Remember what I was first speaking to you about in Isaiah chapter 40? That the Lord doesn't faint, he's not weary. But it says here they didn't faint. This speaks to the beginning of when you began with Christ, or you know, you find yourself after decades, you know, somehow you know, a decade here, a decade there, or five years out from there, you find yourself fainting. Well, that's because you are walking, you're running your race, and you're you're giving out. 
you're giving out things you're receiving from the Lord, but the exhaustion comes when you take over. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of spiritual exhaustion that happens because when we pour out what we've received from Christ, we're not going to the source. And yet at the same time, we're thinking, well, I'll try to do it this way. I'll try to do it that way. Look, I'm going to make no bones about it. And where this falls, let it fall. If you reject it, it's up to you to reject it. If you are serious and you are want, wanting to serve the Lord and you are spiritually exhausted, there's no other life and no other way than to live at the source, than to live at the well and to sit on the well, to draw from the living waters of Jesus Christ, where you go to him alone. I mean, I think of even Nicodemus. Look at Nicodemus. He was unsaved, but he saw something. He didn't know Jesus Christ was referring himself to a well or that there was a well of life or that there was eternal waters, but he saw something and he got up and he went to him at night. It doesn't say midnight. It doesn't say some, a lot of people say midnight, but I never read that it says at midnight. It says he went to him at night. I would think he went to him where he made sure everybody was asleep and he went over there. You know why? Because he wanted to get it from for himself. That has to work in you. If you want to influence your children, you want to be that vessel, that true and honest vessel that God can use, then you're going to have to trust the Lord by going to him and to his source every day. Let me go on because it says, I know thy works. So we know that, you know, the outworking of the Holy Spirit is works by faith and faith by works. And faith by love. Love works by faith and faith works by love. And so you automatically go on to a working to be a member of the kingdom. And that wherever you are, there's a working going on everywhere you go. I don't care where you live, what family you've been born to, what country you live in. I don't care. It doesn't matter. There is an outworking of the Holy Spirit always. Never underestimate it. Never forget it. Then it goes on. Now you have labor. It says, Paul says, God will not forget your work and your labor of love that you have towards his saint. Okay, so that's a labor of love. Then it goes into patience. Now the work is getting greater. It's getting stronger. Now you have to, because now you're dealing with people that are being mean to you. Um, you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and you're spending and being spent. And like Paul said, though I love, I'm less loved. So you're giving out things of yourself to thankless people, to people who are dead in Christ, people who are resistant to the Holy Spirit and they're stiff necked. But there is a godly patience that started out in your work that became a labor of labor of love where patience is working and love. Right. Love is patient. And now. It says, and then it says, and that they couldn't bear them, which are evil, because when you're working, you're able to say, like Titus 1.16, you can look at people or a situation not being a judge, but in a humble, meek way, in the light of that truth of the Holy Spirit and say, they profess that they know God, but in works, they deny him being abominable and and disobedient and in every work reprobate, right? Because you love the word so much, you're like, uh-uh, I'm not cutting corners on it. You know, I, I'm talking about by, your, by the spirit, bearing witness with your spirit saying, I know what I see. And so there's a defense that we are to, def you know, it says that, you know, the Jude talks about uh, to have a defense um, once given unto all, uh, of the gospel given once unto the saints, right? So there's a, a way that we defend it. And sometimes it's not always by telling people you're wrong. Sometimes you got to tell them, but don't ever do it in the flesh. You'll cause more damage than anything. So it goes on and it says, and then it says, and you found them liars. And it says, and you have born. Now you're bearing up the burden, the heat of the day, spiritual sweat, sweat spiritual grit. You're crying in the night. You're crying. You know, it says you're, you know, out of the depths, you're crying unto the Lord. Oh, Lord, hear my cry. Right. You're calling from the depths. So you're bearing. And now it goes again. And you had patience. Now you're going into deeper patience. 
But see, with the Lord in your life, there's always a deepening and an enlarging upward, like the temple, Ezekiel's temple, there was a, a winding and an enlarging upward in the temple. Shouldn't there be that in you? Have you felt that you've grown at any time? Have you felt an expanding of your heart, but yet a narrowing down into the focus of the word of God for yourself? You know, Derek Prince said, there was a time in my life where I got away. There was no clergy. There was no leadership. There was no chaplain. There was nobody. I went alone three years in the wilderness and it changed my life. So you got to go yourself and you got to go talk to the living God himself. That's why he's called the living God. And so, you know, I think about what Jesus says in Luke 18, 1. And he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and what? And not faint. So we see that our non-fainting power is the result of being in heaven in prayer. I don't mean leaving your body. So be clear. I'm not getting into any weird mystical stuff. I'm talking about when a person sets their self Spirit, soul, and body sanctified wholly by the God of peace and everything in your heart, throbbing hard in your heart. You go, I don't know. I don't understand it, but I'm taking it to the living God. I know what he says. He said that if I called upon him, if I sought the Lord with all my heart, that he would hear me. And not only will he hear me, I know what I'll have, what I ask for, because I know him and I've experienced him. Because tribulation worketh exper patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, the out and the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And we have faith in him because now we know him and we're living with him and we're drawing our water from him, our own nourishment. Living waters begin to flow because now a, a spring of water, a fountain has now opened up within you. But you have to be connected to that great fountain it says in zephaniah zechariah chapter 13 verse 1 when christ returns to the earth and after the battle of armageddon after the throne of glory judgment is over and um all the people all the jews all the people they realized after the spirit of grace and supplication has been poured out upon them um it says that in uh, um uh, zechariah 12 10 but in the verse 13, one, it says, then shall a fountain be opened up in Israel. A fountain will be opened up. Well, that's Christ opening up himself. And then later on, we see in that same chapter in verse six, they say to him, it, it says, and one will say unto him, what are these, these wounds in thy hand? And he will answer saying, that which with I was wounded in the house of my friends. I sometimes think in a way, I'm not saying it says this and I'm not going to doctrinize it. I'm just saying, sometimes I look at Judas as a type of the Jews where when he came, Judas came to Jesus and he says, friend, why are you here? Why, are you, why, why did you come here? You know, and he's the one that betrayed him, the betrayer. And then later on, he tells one person that which with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Just a thought. Let's go on. So it goes on in Ephesians. Jesus says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. You know, I think a lot of times many people don't re really realize that they left their first love. I think they get so involved in what they're doing for the Lord that and spending real no time with them and they're they're unbalanced and so they don't know how to allow the lord to let them rest or they don't allow the lord to get them to be quiet because i'll tell you something it, paul apostle says for the kingdom of god is not in word but in power you know sometimes with that we say too much in prayer and so it feels like we've done something one time during my youth 
in my 30s, I was praying, 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 praying. And I'm not, a, and I had this big list. I pray for this. I pray for her. I pray for him. I pray for all these things, right? Well, my, I was sincere. Well, after about three weeks of it, I was spiritually exhausted. And I heard the Lord speak these words into my heart by his spirit. He said, you're praying for everything. But in reality, you're praying for nothing. I spread my own self out so thin that all I was doing was just chattering away. But now I have narrowed it down. I'm going to go on. Jesus says, so sometimes we don't, we don't purposely leave our first love. We just, it happens. But he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works. Or else I will come into you quickly and will remove the candlestick, your thy candlestick out of his place, except you repent. So light, we at the same time, then when you see that, you realize you lose light. So what you began in the beginning and you had all this light and you were working and then you go into and then you have a labor of love and now you have patience and you're defending the word. And now it says you're now you're bearing under power and you're pressure and increased patience and there was this light and now all of a sudden you have spiritual exhaustion it seems as if the candlestick has been removed out of your life there's no light there's no direction now you're getting all frustrated you're getting angry you're you're snapping off at your family you're getting angry because you can't come up with something out of the word and next thing you know you're all stressed out and now you're angry and you're fretting against the Lord, forget it. You might as well go away. Go put a roast in the oven. So it says to remember from where you're fallen, repent. Tell God you're sorry. Realize that you've done it. Even if you didn't realize you do it, just tell him, Lord, I realize I've done this. That's all he's asking you to do. And he says, do the first works. In other words, go back. You can go back. There, there's still a place open for you. Just go back and start doing it again. And you know what? Everything that needs to be burned up let it be burned up all that work that you've been doing that's not of me better it be burned up here than in the at the great white throne judgment which by the way i believe that if we repent for all the wrong things that we have taught um the twisted way we perceive the word and all the times that we may be taught or did things but our hearts were never in it in the spirit of love if you repent for it now god will burn it up right now and those works will not follow you into the kingdom at the beam of seat. And so he goes on to say, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. And you know what I realized this morning when I read that? You know, when Jesus was alive on earth and Matthew in two places, I'll just say one. Jesus would always say, he who hath ears, multiple, you have two, he that hath ears to hear let him hear that was when he was alive that was 2000 years ago and he narrows it down to the letters to the seven churches and to all seven churches he says to them at the end you know he that overcomes to him will i and then there's all these seven overcome rewards and what does he say to them he narrows it down to one ear he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches and then he narrows it down for the third and final time. And he says in Revelation 13, 9, if any man here, and that's the last time he ever says it, Jesus, if any man have an ear, let him, let him hear. And isn't that interesting where that is placed during that one chapter where the Antichrist is revealed, the man of sin. Satan's deified man. And is that not where we are today? We don't know who he is, and he soon will be revealed in his time. But I believe that we are at that time. Be careful who you're hearing from. Be careful where your source is. Where, remember, where did your service start? 
from? Did it start from some self sympathy? Like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go do this apart from Christ. Or did your service begin from the basis of redemption of Jesus Christ? Where you first started in the spirit? You know, I would say to you, continually go back to the foundation of your true love and of your affections and recollect where the source of power is and never depart from him again. Return to him. You know, really, in essence, you have no right to say, oh, Lord, I'm so exhausted. But you know why? Because he saved you in order to exhaust you. Be exhausted for God, but remember that your supply comes from him. And in closing, these are the words that I love that Amy Carmichael said. The entrance, the entrancing things of a life spent partly for the things of time are just nothing beside those prepared who will go all the way with him. But let it be all the way, halfway leads to nowhere. Go all the way with him. He's the only one that will take you up that mountain.